A downside surprise on inflation in America. Equities absolutely rocketing higher. Yields lower, the dollar weaker. Equity futures right now of 2.8%. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue, inflation calling down the Fed. Coming up next. This is a really interesting uh, CPI report. The CPI data. Very important. It's going to determine the narrative. No doubt. You know, you look at the headline numbers, you look at core, uh, better than expected. And then we have the Fed announcement. What are we going to hear from Chair Powell? Obviously, they can step down to 50 basis points. The Fed is hyper-focused on bringing down inflation. What the market is saying is that the Fed is expected to start cutting rates in 2023. Data of this nature allows them likely to do that. It will all depend on how long um, inflation is going to be staying elevated. The Fed is saying they're going to keep rates high in there until the job is done, until inflation comes down. Higher for longer. They're trying to monitor how the economy is reacting to those hikes. The Fed is waiting to be, you know, proved right on the inflation side. We're already trading the headlines. Let's get you some new ones. Here's Mike McKee for more. Hey, Mike. Hey, John. Well, this is the kind of numbers the Fed is looking for. It does ratify the 50 basis point move tomorrow. But the question now becomes what happens in 2023? You can see that headline and core inflation came in lower than expected on a month over month basis, which drops the headline uh, C, uh, CPI to 7.1% and the core to 6%, lower than people anticipated for this month of the year. Uh, what moved? Well, gasoline was down 2% 2 after rising the month before, so no surprise there. We've seen uh, the prices come down at the pump. Food is still a problem, up half a percent. And here's the one that people are still watching, owner's equivalent rent, basically what it costs to buy your house or to rent your house. So if you were uh, buying it, it would be the rental cost, up 7%. That's a rebound. But the Fed has already said we know that is coming down. So in essence, you can look at the numbers we got today and think they're kind of really lower than that. Used cars, performance expected. Apparel did not. It was up two tenths. We thought there'd be a lot of sales. Uh, the good news, bad news uh, part of it is that goods prices are continuing to decelerate down uh, or up rather by just three quarters of a percentage point and services are continuing to accelerate, unfortunately, but take out housing and energy. You're at 5.1% versus 5.8%. So the Fed is making progress on the whole thing. Now, that's what happened. What's going to happen? That's going to be the interesting thing going forward. We talked earlier today about the inflation swaps market. The inflation swaps market now has the overall CPI at are you ready for this? 3.4% by May. And that is the month that the markets think, futures trading thinks that we are going to see the highest, the peak of the Fed funds rate. It's come down about 10 basis points, but 4.86%. The Fed has never brought inflation down until it raises the Fed funds rate above the level of inflation. And it looks like the markets are betting that is going to happen by May. So it may not be a recession, it may be a drop in CPI that people are looking at to uh, start pricing in some rate cuts. Mike McKee, Chairman Powell, over to you. Looking forward to your coverage tomorrow, Mike. I always am. Equities right now, going into the opening bell. Equity futures up by 2.9% on the S&P, yield to lower at the front end by almost 19 basis points on a two-year. Let's call it sub-420 on a two-year yield in America and a ton of dollar weakness in the mix as well. Euro dollar 106.56, euro dollar up by more than 1%. With us now is Morgan Stanley's Matt Hornback, Troy Gersky of FS Investments. Matt, first to you, your reaction to the CPI report from 34 minutes ago. Well, John, thanks for having me on. Look, I mean, investors didn't think inflation was going to come down as fast as economists were forecasting. And now it's coming down even faster than economists are forecasting. I think this is big, a big deal uh, for macro markets. It's a big deal for the outlook uh, in 2023. 
we, we published our 2023 outlook about a month ago, John, and already markets have moved uh, in the direction that we were expecting just much, much sooner, which is, again, is in line with CPI falling faster than any economist on the street was projecting. Troy Gajewski, your thoughts, sir? Yeah, I think, as Jim was saying, what, one thing that's so remarkable about this cycle, whether you look at real estate or equities or bond yields or now inflation, it's, it's not just the magnitude of the moves, uh, it's also the speed, right? And so what went up really fast is now coming down faster than most thought as recently as six weeks ago. And I think, you know, from an asset allocation standpoint, if you think about what this means, it's, hey, if you were overly uh, allocated to equities and fixed income throughout this whole year, you're breathing a bigger sigh of relief that perhaps there isn't as much downside in the future as there could have been before inflation came down. The the darker side of that uh, interpretation, though, John, is, you know, if you're putting new money to work now, it's like if you blinked, you missed it, right? We're, <laughs> we're back up to 18 times next year's Ford earnings, which is still assuming a 5% earnings growth, which clearly won't happen if we end a recession. And, and you know, the 10 year, it's like, man, we got to four and a quarter in a pico second, and we're already sub three and a half. So it, it you know, it took seven north of 8% CPI prints just to get you a four and a quarter 10 year for a pico second. So, you know, good in, in the short term, good news if you're over allocated to duration and beta. But over the long term, you know, it just reiterates the need to look elsewhere for things that can actually make seven, eight, nine percent type returns. Well, I know you've got a suggestion for that. We'll get to it a little bit later, I promise, Troy. Matt Hornback, I want to come back to you. We heard from President Harker of the Federal Reserve in the last couple of months, and he talked about inflation and he described it as up like a rocket and maybe down like a feather. And Matt, what I hear from you is that you're pushing back against that view going into 23. Matt, can you tell me, when you look beneath the headline number for the inflation data the report we got this morning, what is in there that makes you believe with conviction that we're going to continue this trade, keep coming down and maybe quicker than people anticipate? Well, John, I don't think you have to ask me. You can ask the Federal Reserve. What they've been focused on more recently are the lags with which monetary policy operate. Now, these lags are traditionally thought to operate somewhere between a 12 and an 18 month time frame. Well, if inflation is coming down, like within, you know, essentially six to nine months of the Fed taking policy rates higher off of the zero lower bound. If inflation is coming down three, four months after the Fed's balance sheet has begun to shrink, all of a sudden it completely reframes that 12 to 18 month lag between monetary policy tightening and inflation coming down. So if you think about it, John, the policy rate at the end of this year will be somewhere around four and a half percent. Uh, maybe it goes up again in, in, in 2023. But regardless, if the policy lags are already starting to put downward pressure on inflation, in addition to fiscal stimulus no longer being the boon that it once was, uh, you're talking about supply chains improving pretty dramatically over the course of the past quarter or two. Um, all of a sudden, you're, th you're thinking, wow, maybe inflation can come down a lot faster next year, which, of course, will then have implications for how long the Fed is going to need to keep policy this restrictive. I mean, John, we're talking 200, 250 basis points of policy restriction. These are the types of levels of restriction we haven't seen in decades. I don't know if the economy it will be able to deal with that level of restriction all throughout 2023. So, Matt, you're bringing up some really important points. So let's dissect some of it. Just piece by piece. Got the terminal rate, how high the Fed ultimately goes, and then the length of time that they're going to stay there. So let's deal with the first bit first. 460 was the median dot in 23 in the last set of projections from this Fed. Overwhelmingly, as I go through the research, I see numbers like 5 to 525. I see that number from Bank of America, from Cities Hall and Horse. They're looking for the dot next year, the median dot for 23, to rise to maybe 5, 525. Goldman Sachs yes, gets the number. 5525. Five, Matt, what do you expect they're going to signal tomorrow? And ultimately, where do you expect it lands in reality next year? So, John, you didn't mention Morgan Stanley in there, and that's why you have me on, because we don't agree with that view. We think it's possible that the median dot for 2023 gets up to four and five eighths, so four, or four and seven eighths, rather. That's 4.875 or 4.9, as you would see it on the dot plot. Uh, but we think there's a very good chance that policy doesn't get that high. Uh, it, it would seem to me that after this type of report, 
uh, that the soft landing the Fed is looking to engineer is on course. Uh, and so you don't necessarily need to drive the economy into recession to bring inflation down. That suggests to me you, you could have a policy rate that peaks below 5 percent, which is in line with Ellen Zentner, our chief U.S. economist, call for policy. Troy, do you agree? Yeah, so I think there's what the Fed should do and what the Fed ultimately does, and those are very hard to dissect in real time. You know, we'd still go with five and five to five and a quarter for the time being. I think what this report does is it dramatically reduces the probability of going above five to five and a quarter, and it also does pull some wiggle room for the Fed to cut towards the back end of next year in the event that we enter a recession Q2 or Q3 as unemployment ticks higher. And, and I think Matt, you know, and his team, um, like led by Mike Wilson and others, have been articulating this case as we have. You know, ultimately, you know, as the Fed ceases tightening uh, on the front end, behind that, you know, the balance sheet continues to shrink, and so markets are going to have to deal with a drain of liquidity in the short term. But ultimately, when we roll over into recession, which still looks highly probable um, to us right now, given that the U.S. consumer is deteriorating, again, at a very rapid speed in terms of withholding tax, uh, in terms of uh, if you look at spending versus inflationary pressures and real incomes, and, and just look at where savings rates have gone, John, 7.3 percent before the pandemic and now down to you know a two handle. So there's not a lot of dry powder left to spend. So when that ultimately happens, it becomes more about a growth concern, uh, revenue dropping in terms of uh, nominal GDP and ultimately drop in earnings by 10 to 20 percent. So, you know, that will more than likely be the final laid down for equities this cycle. But this report is important because it really puts five and five and a quarter at, at more of a top. Um, and it does give the Fed some wiggle room to cut towards the end of next year, very modestly, not aggressively like they've done in the past. Uh, but that does give some uh, relief to the economy late next year, or early 24. Troy, let's pick up on that because I'm getting pushback on the growth side of that equation. From Neil Dutter at Renaissance Macro, who this morning said real incomes are up, which helps consumption. The dollar is down, which helps manufacturing and exports. Rates are down, which helps residential investment. Credit spreads are narrowing. It's good for CapEx. The Bloomberg News consensus sees flat GDP in the first half of 23. Neil says good luck with that forecast. And Troy, I've got to say Neil's not alone. Max Kettner of HSBC said this this morning. We increasingly believe the widespread belief of a weak first half is misplaced. He went on to say that activity data is still surprising to the upside. Both top-down and bottom-up expectations have been downgraded so much in recent months that it makes further positive activity surprises likely. Troy, just a final word from you on that. Yeah, so you'd get no disagreement from us that uh, the economy is going to continue to expand in the first quarter and more than likely the first half. I mean, the soonest we could see recession right now is late Q2. Um, and arguably the latest is Q1 of uh, 24. So, yeah, I think the first half, given the, the uh, momentum of the consumer and the fact that CapEx is picking back up, uh, that makes a lot of sense. But, you know, ultimately, if you look at the trajectory of the ability for the consumer to spend, as soon as the labor market starts to meaningfully weaken, which is effectively what the Fed still wants to happen, um, and when you look at all the wealth destruction going on in housing, you look at the fact that, you know, I'd like to see that data point that says real incomes are up. Uh, they're up 1% since the pandemic, and they're certainly not enough the last 12 months. Uh, it, it just means we're in for a milder recession, much, much less severe than we had in the pandemic or the global financial crisis, much more in line with what we had in a one. Uh, but ultimately, earnings will suffer more from that, again, principally from margin compression as opposed to a loss of revenue, as we typically see in recessions. Matt Hornback, final question. November 4th, shortly after we got the payrolls report that morning, the two-year came very close to 480. It's down to 415 this morning, and it's negative 23 basis points on a session. Matt, can you say with some confidence that that was it? Matt, in early November, that was the peak of this cycle. We're done with that. John, that was the peak in rates in this cycle, for sure. Matt Hornback, Troy Gersky sticking with us. Coming up on this program, the growth backdrop and what on earth is happening in China. COVID ripping through China. When China reopens, it's not quite ready to reopen in terms of its uh, health care system, its immunization uh, uh, position. There's a big reopening to come in China. I don't think it's happening now. That conversation, up next.
there's a big reopening to come in China. I don't think it's happening now. When it does happen, I think you are going to see uh, a very strong lift in growth. China has been seriously depressed by the uh, COVID problems and it's going to continue to be so for a little while. Uh, and I think it will boost commodity prices. But Uncertainty gripping China as COVID cases surge amid rapid reopening measures. Beijing postponing a key economic policy meeting, which was set to begin on Thursday. Even banks setting up contingency plans with traders calling out sick and trading volumes falling. For more, let's get to Damien Sasser at Bloomberg Intelligence. Damien, it was that last line that got my attention this morning. The COVID cases are piling up that quickly. We're seeing volume drop away in markets. Damien, is that right? Yeah, no, absolutely. You're seeing trading volume and dollar yuan falling off a cliff, really, because uh, traders in Beijing can't go back to work. But Jonathan, really, what this for me means is that um, most people who are looking for 5% growth in China in 2023 are expecting consumption to lead the way. We have activity data coming out, you know, in the next couple of days from China. It's going to be weak. Retail sales are going to be weak. But for me, you know, how could we possibly think that consumption is going to pick up? Remember, consumption is over half of China's GDP in terms of contribution to it's going to remain very tight and it's going to be very, very difficult. This is not going to be a very easy reopening of China as we're now seeing. And so, you know, these GDP forecasts kind of get thrown away with the trash. And I think that's exactly what's happening here, especially in lieu of the CPI print out of the U.S. Well, Damon, you know better than most how it works. You trade the policy change and then you look for the results some way in the future. They're way out there at the back end of 23, maybe. Damien, when do you expect to see the positive results of this shift in policy we're all witnessing in the last couple of weeks? Well, I think actually what we may have to see is Beijing front load um, extension of credit into the economy during the first half of next year. I don't think the markets are really priced for this. If we see something akin to 2009, 2010 in China, where they're just basically throwing money at the issue in order to get this economy right short, I mean, things could get very, uh, very interesting and quickly. And what that could do, quite frankly, and we mentioned this yesterday, is it could lead to inflationary pressures in the back half of 2023. So to your point, everyone trying to kind of map out what this means for the Fed. You know, imagine if they're seeing inflationary pressures out of China, which right now CPI is running at only 1.7 percent. We're talking 7.1 here in the U.S. It's significantly less than China with scope to rise from here. Hey, Damien, wonderful, as always. Back with us, Matt Hornback, Troy Gersky. Matt Hornback, inflation fading in America. Enter China. How does that influence your views on next year, Matt? Look, John, our, our view of it is that if you're talking about inflation in China, you can talk about inflation in China. It doesn't necessarily have very big implications for inflation outside of China, just like the disinflation that we saw in China this year hardly had implications for inflation outside of the country. So when we think about China reopening, we do acknowledge that it's going to be a bumpy process. And in fact, I would say the bumpiest part of the process is very likely to be from where we are today over the course of the winter. It seems very clear to us that the policymakers in China have made some very tough decisions, but are are going to follow through on those decisions. And that will set actually up a very nice reopening in the spring as it becomes warmer in the country. Uh, and the pe people have been infected. They're going out then. They start spending. Uh, the economy reopens more fully as we make our way through the spring. That should continue to improve the supply side, which we think will, on the margin, add to increasing disinflationary pressure in the U.S. as well as in other parts of the world outside of China. Troy, good news or bad news? Yeah, well, it, it's good in the short term for growth, a, a little bit negative for longer term inflation. But I, I think the big picture here, right, is the, the reason this inflationary cycle's been so problematic, right, is that once upon a time, this is a supply chain issue, a commodity issue, and then obviously it's spread to labor and services. So, so to Matt's point, I mean, if you look at the principal pressures, it's really coming from labor and services. And that's why the Fed has been so committed. It's just much harder to break. So, you know, I think we should uh, applaud the good news today on CPI. Be realistic that some of the big uh, disinflationary drivers like uh, globalization and, you know, China's labor pool opening up to the world the last 20 years are, are no longer there. And uh, the Fed will struggle to get inflation back to three, but it does look like that's entirely possible uh, given the progress that's made recently. Nine minutes away from the open and bound, equities up big time by more than 3%, echoing the kind of move we saw a month or so ago, the November 10th inflation report where CPI delivered a downside surprise in this equity market absolutely ripped into the close. Yields are lower now at the front end by 23 basis points to 415 on a two year. And this dollar, is a whole lot weaker. Euro dollar right now, 106.62. Just enough time, guys, to talk about conviction trades into 23. Troy, I promised you the space to do it, so get there. What do you want to be? Yeah, man, Where do you want to be into so, next year? 
Hey, it's senior secured commercial real estate loans. I mean, if you look at uh, what's going on in the real estate market um, right now, uh, it's basically a wealth transfer from owner operators to lenders. You want to be on the right side of that trade. I mean, ultimately, if you think of any lending strategy or credit strategy, they fought lower rates in the front end, particularly if they're floating rate, as well as tighter spreads for most of the last 10 to 13 years. And now both of those are going the right direction for lenders. You, you get the benefit of a higher yield in the front end. You also get the benefit to lend at wider spreads into lower LTVs. And so bottom line is when you look at strategies that are in the Northwest quadrant and the fish and frontier, anything that can make 70% pre or post tax advantage that can still benefit to some extent by the Fed hiking at least marginally more, um, that's a great anchor in your portfolio that can replace fixed income, can actually act as a substitute for equities. And you certainly want to roll up the capital structure in, in real estate right now. And if you want Troy to explain what any of that means, give him a call because we don't have time. <laughs> Matt Hornback, Matt, final words, sir. John, we've liked the dollar lower for a month or two now. We continue to like the dollar lower in 2023. And I would say the real opportunity in the interest rate complex is a curve steepener here in the U.S. We think the curve is much too flat for the type of disinflation that we're going to end up seeing in 2023. The bond market is entirely unprepared for something to come down, for inflation to come down this quickly. And the yield curve is much too flat. We should see a much steeper curve, John, led by the intermediate sector of the yield curve. Let's call it the five-year point. Uh, fives, thirties should uh, disinvert, if you will. It's a little steeper today but because the two-year is absolutely rocketing lower by 23 basis points. Matt Hornback, Troy Gersky, to the both of you, always fun. Thanks, gents. 4.15 on a two-year, your equity market up by more than 3%. Coming up, the morning calls and later, the end of big tech out performance. That's the view from BlackRock's Gargi Chowdhury. She joins us around the open and bow from New York. This is Bloomberg. Just look at this move going into the Fed. Following a downside surprise on CPI, equities up 3% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, up 4 Punchy stuff going into the opening bow. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Citi, raising Nike's price target to 115, expecting the company to report a beat on stronger sales and margins. That stock is up by 3.8%. Goldman upgrading Pfizer to buy. Price target 60, seeing potential for our performance on new product launches. And finally, Piper Sandler raising Oracle's price target to 85, citing higher growth and free cash flow margin into next year. That stock is up by more than 4%. Coming up, stocks absolutely surging. Risk assets rallying off the back of cooler inflation. That conversation with BlackRock's Gargi Chowdhury next. The Nasdaq has new rules. If you are short into the opening bell on a day that you get a downside surprise on CPI, apparently you get slimed, which I think is brutal. Equity futures right now up by 2.9% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq up by 3.9%. CPI, downside surprise. This equity market absolutely flying. There's your opening bell switch at the board in the bond market. Treasuries firmer, a whole lot firmer. Yield to lower on a 10-year by 18 basis points. You can call it 17 now. 343.58 on a 10 year. And this move on Euro dollar, a ton of dollar weakness in the mix. Euro dollar 106.61. We're positive on that currency pair by more than 1%, 1.2% 1 higher. That's some Euro strength, some dollar weakness. And dollar weakness is dominant in G10 right now. Crude up by 1.7%, $74 and almost 50 cents. About 25 seconds into this one, the SP up by 2.6%. The NASDAQ up by 3.6%. We've got to break down some big news this morning, not just the CPI report looking ahead to the Federal Reserve tomorrow, but Katie Lyons, some big changes this morning for Bankman Freed. Yeah, the hits just keep coming, John. Already he has been uh, charged by the SEC of defrauding investors of $1.8 billion. And now the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, is also suing Sam Bankman Freed, of course, the disgraced co founder of FTX. The CFTC claiming violations of federal commodities laws over FTX. And of course, there already was a bit of a jurisdictional bat battle over the CFTC and SEC. Who has control over what when it comes to crypto assets? But both of these regulators coming after Bankman 
Bankman Freed after, of course, he was arrested in the Bahamas yesterday. That related to criminal charges that we are still awaiting the unsealing of from the Southern District of New York. We are expecting a press conference around that later on this morning, John. But of course, his arrest in the Bahamas yesterday and the request for him to be extradited to the United States means he will not be testifying as planned in the House Financial Services Committee hearing, which also begins later this morning. There are so many moving parts to the story and a lot of different people looking to take action against Sam Bankman Freed for, again, what is alleged fraud. Kaylee, can we just talk about the timing of all of this? You've just gone through a range of issues there. At 10 a.m., this is not the 10 a.m. hearing we expected to have. Yeah. That changed yesterday with his arrest. Then we're going to hear from the Southern District of New York. We've already heard from the SEC. We're hearing now from the CFTC. What do you make of the timing of this, Kaylee? all at once, all together, ahead of what was meant to be a hearing on Capitol Hill with him? There definitely has been some conspiracy theories, I would say, circulating, at least that I have seen on Twitter, about the timing of this, considering Sam Bankman-Fried was not just a player in the crypto industry. He also had become somewhat of a political force in terms of campaign donations and lobbying efforts on Capitol Hill. So that is something that, yes, you have to factor in the equation. But the, ha the fact that all of this is happening on the same day and, frankly, happening so quickly, remember, it's only been about a month since FTX declared bankruptcy. So all of these cases uh, for actual charges to be being placed today, that that timeline is much, much more accelerated and really speaks to the intensity uh, of scrutiny on this particular issue, considering that there are millions of people who have lost billions of dollars in this episode, and a lot of people are looking for Sam Bankman free to pay for that. Kaylee, thank you. As always, just wonderful. Kaylee's going to stick with us. Make sure you don't miss this. Bloomberg Crypto today, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. in London. Kelly Lyons, Matt Miller with a big, big show coming up. Big interview coming up in about 27 minutes' time as well. The CFTC Commissioner joining Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. Looking forward to that conversation a little bit later. We'll catch up with Shanali Basak down in D.C. in about 10 minutes' time alongside Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern as well. One stock I want to look at around the opening bow because this is a big open. We've got United up by about 2.5 percent this morning. The company announcing a blockbuster deal with Boeing to buy up to 300 new planes. The take of the morning, without a doubt, from Connor Sen of Bloomberg Opinion tweeted in the following, weird, they violated the business rule that you can't make massive wide body plane orders when the ISM is below 50 and the yield curve is inverted. That is a ton of sarcasm from Connor Sen. Businesses are still getting deals done and you're seeing big investment as well from the likes of United with Boeing. We'll pick up on that story a little bit later. Another story I want to pick up on, Tesla. That stock has been hammered over the last week. Joining us now is Ed Ludlow from the West Coast for more. Ed, can you run us through what's going on here? A little bit of relief for investors this morning. The stock's up by 3%, but this market's yeah. absolutely ripping anyway. What's your thoughts on what's taken place in yeah. the last week? I mean, broadly speaking, the automotive sector or group has been downtrodden because of high inflation, right? And so the CPI print, you see an immediate reaction across all names. Tesla's included that up by about 3.3%, biggest jump in almost two weeks. And it's kind of reversing some of the losses that we saw Monday, which took that stock to a three-week low. Um, a lot of headlines. You know, investors are trying to make sense of the direction of travel of this stock. We're now trading at 30 times projected earnings, which is the cheapest this stock's been since listing, which is something strange to say out loud. But, you know, that chart tells the story. It's true. I think the S&P 500 trading at around 17 times projected earnings. You can still see there's a premium when it comes to Tesla. There's concern, right? I think that a lot of influential uh, voices in the Tesla community, retail investors, uh, sell side analysts, institutional investors that I speak to are concerned about the Twitter overhang, not just that this potential move by Musk to swap out some of the secured or unsecured debt, sorry, for margin loans, which would be secured against Tesla stock. But the idea of key man risk is still there. Another interesting Bloomberg report overnight, John, uh, SpaceX is uh, doing a tender offer, $77 for insiders to sell shares, valuing the company at around $140 billion. I think the big question we're asking ourselves is if SpaceX proceed with this tender, um, does Elon Musk sell? And that would, of course, impact his, his wealth uh, because SpaceX is a big chunk of it. Just real quick, John, go to Rich Go on the Bloomberg Terminal, Bloomberg Billionaires Index. There's $900 million that separate Elon Musk, who's in top spot, from Bernard Arnault. Uh, and obviously, Tesla's stock going upwards at this moment in time. But, you know, that could change any day, depending on what happens. Ed, thank you. Just one of those rare cases where someone thinks their company is worth a whole lot more in private markets this year compared to what's been happening more broadly in markets 
in general. Six minutes into the session, we're up by more than 2% on the S&P 500. Across the board, looking at the sector breakdown, we're positive. From consumer staples, where the relative underperformances were up by about 1% there. The outperformance from communication services up 3.6%. Information technology up by 3.3%. BlackRock's Gargi Chowdhury joins us now. Gargi, you've had about an hour to go through this inflation report. What do you make of it? Hi, good morning. Good to be here, John. Um, so policy is working. Everything that the Fed has been doing, as difficult as that has been for the markets, what the inflation data today shows us that it is it is going in the right direction. We are seeing core and headline inflation move lower. And you know, one of the things that I have been looking for is that core services X of shelter inflation. And of course, Jay Powell told us to watch that. Uh, and that is moving lower. So overall, this is a very good first or second step that the Fed will be very comforted by. But it is not the end. Uh, this is not the time to get complacent. There is a lot more to do. And I think, uh, you know, tomorrow we're, I'm sure we'll talk more about that, but tomorrow we'll hear exactly that from the Fed. Sense of relief, but it's not over yet. Well, Gargi, let's talk about the regime change. I heard from Philip Hildebrand of BlackRock, was reading through some of his comments this morning, who said, we've gone through this regime change now, that even into next year, the bonds won't work in the way that people think the bonds will work. Now, I can tell you the bonds overwhelmingly are working this morning, and you can see that on the screen, because I've got a two-year yield yeah. down by about 18 basis points. But can yeah. you speak to that, Gargi, just a little bit more? Sure, of course. And we came out with our iShares Investment Strategy Outlook Guide as well, where we are talking about the theme that, John, I've spoken in your show before, where we've talk about, talked about this yield of dreams and this idea that we've moved away from the regime of TINA, where there was no alternative or is no alternative, to the new one where bonds are back. Where they are back, though, is in the very front end of the curve. And obviously, we're seeing a move like this today, uh, which, uh, you know, which is good, which is exactly what we've been talking about. But I think that we have to remember, and I think this is what we talk about when we talk about this newer regime, is that we're not going to go back to the pre-pandemic zero rates anytime soon. In a world where inflation is likely to rest in the 25 to 3% core inflation, uh, you know, sort of uh, for the next couple of years, instead of a one and a half to two percent, rates are likely to be higher for longer, not lower for longer. And that is the new regime. So even though today on our Bloomberg screens, we are seeing a tremendous move across the Treasury curve, which is exactly what we would expect to see. And obviously, given the valuation in fixed income, it makes a lot of sense for investors to be gravitating to income owning parts of the market. I would still say that we should brace ourselves to stay in a, a regime of higher for longer, not lower for longer. And what I mean by that is expect to see the Fed tomorrow tell us that we're going to perhaps move interest rates up to sort of somewhere around the 5% range over the next couple of months and then stay there for some time instead of immediately coming back down to below 4.5%, which is unfortunately what the market's pricing in now. Well, you're certainly pushing back against some of these moves we're seeing this morning then on the S&P, we're up by more mm -hmm. than 2%, on the Nasdaq, we're up by more than 3 you mentioned that rally in the bond market. Yield to lower on a 10-year by 15 basis points on a 10-year right now. 346 on a two-year, we're down 18 basis points to about 420. I'll stay on top of the price action. Got to stay on top of some of the charges being leveled against Sam Bankman-Fried as well. We heard from the SEC a little bit earlier this morning. In the last 20 minutes or so, we've heard from the CFTC. We're also waiting for some detail from the Southern District of New York. This New York court, that indictment against Sam Bankman-Fried has been unsealed. We're waiting to see, Kaylee, whether we get a little bit more detail in the next couple of minutes. But I imagine everyone's scramble, scrambling to pour through that. Yeah, trying to get my hands on the indictment right now, John, but we understand from the Associated Press that Sam Bankman-Fried has been charged with wire fraud, money laundering, violating campaign finance laws as well in an eight count indictment. So again, we will look, John, for what all of those different counts are confirmation from the Southern District of New York. And we are expecting a press conference to be held not too long from now, around 10 a.m. Eastern time. But again, that indictment in the Southern District of New York has been unsealed at this time. John. What a busy morning. Kelly, we'll come back to you in just a little bit. I want to go back to this price action. On the S&P, we're up by more than 2%. On the Nasdaq, we're up by more than 3 percentage points. Tech is outperforming today. But we've heard a lot of people tell us this week that maybe that's not a story that's going to continue. We caught up with Dan Suzuki of RB Advisors in the last 24 hours. Take a listen to what he had to say about tech leadership. Bear markets 
always signal a change in leadership. This is still the area of the market that's the most expensive area of the market. Expectations are due high. You're not going to see, even in a bull case scenario, you're not going to see the trajectory of earnings growth that you saw over the last decade to justify you know, that performance. A lost decade is par for the course. Gagi, I think you might agree with some of that. You said the accommodative monetary policy that drove the decade-long outperformance of growth and large-cap technology in particular is over. Gagi, just a final word on that. Speak to me about it. Yeah, I think that we got used to over the last 15 years this idea that real rates are going to stay, stay zero to negative for a long, long time. And whenever we get in trouble, the Fed's going to come and slash rates to zero. And that obviously is amazing for multiple expansion in the longest duration part of the equity market. We are no longer in that regime. Rates higher for longer, good for clipping coupon, bad for, I think, some of these longer duration, large cap tech type of names till the Fed tells us that they're going to cut rates. And I think we're far away from that. Uh, so for now, I think the areas of the market where you are likely to do better is in the value sectors of the economy, which tend to do better as rates remain higher. So look at value names, look at IWD, look at uh, small caps and mid cap names as well, if you're really looking to add some risk to your equity portfolio. But the highest conviction trade I still have remains that bonds are back and own front end fixed income and credit. Gagi Chowdhury of BlackRock, thank you. As always, your equity market right now up by more than 2% on the S&P and the Nasdaq up by more than 3 percentage points. Massive rally into the bond market off the back of this move on CPI. Downside surprise yields lower, a whole lot lower. Coming up, the charges piling up for Sam Bankman-Fried. It's really a landmark case um, and it will in many respects define crypto regulations for um, exchanges going forward. That conversation, I'm next. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. The president of France and our own Maria Tadeo are speaking at a Ukraine conference. This is Bloomberg. Justice seems uh, to be you know, in process, which I think is welcomed by those in the in the crypto industry. It's actually moved very swiftly. I mean, th this is actually all happening in just over a month. So they've definitely moved very quickly. There's really a landmark case. Um, and it will, in many respects, define crypto regulations for um, exchanges going forward. The charges piling up for Sam Bankman-Fried. Charged by the SEC for defrauding investors of $1.8 billion, the chair Gary Gensler saying in a news release the following, we allege that Sam Bankman-Fried built a house of cards on a foundation of deception while telling investors that it was one of the safest buildings in crypto. An indictment this morning also from a federal court here in New York alleging, quote, Bankman-Fried agreed with others to defraud customers of FDX.com by misappropriating those customers' deposits and using those deposits to pay expenses and debts of Alameda Research. Your team coverage... Starts right now with Bloomberg Anne Marie and Shanali Basak down in DC. Kelly Lines alongside me here in New York. Kelly, first to you. You're going through that indictment unsealed this morning. Walk us through the headlines. Well, there's a number of them coming out. Many charges in total here in the Southern District of New York, including wire fraud and conspiracy counts, as well as Sam Bankman Free being accused of campaign finance violations. And that, John, one that is probably going to be of great political interest, especially with the hearings on Capitol Hill today, because remember, he was one of the largest donors in this midterm election cycle in 2022. When you go through the indictment itself, as I said, it is uh, very extensive, but they say from at least in or about 2019 up to and including or about November 2020 in the Southern District of New York and elsewhere, Sam Bankman Freed willfully and knowingly did combine, conspire, confederate and agree together with each other to commit wire fraud in violation of Title 18. And it goes on to talk about uh, the conspiracy knowingly having devised and intended uh, to defraud investors and obtain money for property, false means and fraudulent pretenses, reputations. A lot of legal jar jargon here, John, of course, we'll continue to work through it. But Again, many charges filed against Sam bankman freed here in the Southern District of New York. Hey, Kelly, you keep reading. I'll come back to you in about a minute's time. Shanali, this one's unraveling really quickly in the last 24 hours. 
In the last 24 hours, think about what a flurry of news we've had from the SEC to the CFTC. I am standing right outside of the House Committee that is going to be talking to the new CEO of FTX to ask him how all of this has happened as they try to figure out how they make rules going forward ahead. Remember everything that Kaylee was saying, not only about the charges that he's facing from the Southern District of New York, which are criminal counts, by the way, John. In addition to that, there's that campaign finance aspect where a number of the lawmakers that will be questioning the new FTX CEO have taken money from Sam Bankman-Fried. And by the way, the same goes for agriculture, which is more closely linked to the CFTC. Tomorrow you'll hear from the Senate. That includes Sherrod Brown, who has voiced skepticism in the past about how these new laws will be handled with such intense lobbying that has been done, including from companies such as FTX, as they make new laws that govern this industry. But for now, we know a lot of information from these complaints in terms of how Alameda, the hedge fund tied to Sam Bankman-Fried, had essentially an unlimited line of credit when it came to FTX and the use of its customer deposits as it looked to fill trades. AMH, you heard it, that line, campaign finance violation. Yeah. Your thoughts? Well, John, I'm just reading it now. It says, from the start, Stan Bankman-Fried improperly diverted customer assets to his privately held crypto hedge fund. And it goes on and said, use those customer links to make undisclosed venture investments, lavish real estate purchases, and large political donations. That is a massive embarrassment for all these lawmakers on Capitol Hill that has received campaign finances and donations from Samuel Bankman Free. Now, Jonathan, we should also note, besides the fact that he was one of the biggest, the second biggest actually in this election cycle outside of George Soros, his top deputy, as Shanali said earlier in surveillance, was giving at the same rate as individuals like Peter Thiel, a name we don't hear all the time, but his top deputy was also giving to Republicans. So more than 60 million was given this election cycle from these two executives at this company. And already what you see is politicians starting to backtrack and unwind and saying they're going to be using those uh, campaign donations and give to charitable, either side of the party. But uh, it's an incredibly embarrassing moment, Jonathan, especially because he was supposed to be their star witness today to really show that they were going after him. And there was no bias. But um, of course, this is the first time Congress is really getting a handle and being able to go after this collapse we saw from early November of this company and FTX bankruptcy, but their star witness is not going to be there. So, you, you know, Maxine Waters wasn't too happy about that. Kelly, some of this is absolutely scathing. This quote, Bankman Freed was orchestrating a massive years-long fraud, diverting billions of dollars of the trading platform's customer funds for his own personal benefit and to help grow his crypto empire. Katie, you've had a bit more time to read the document. Walk us through it. Well, there's eight counts in total, and as Shanali correctly said, these are criminal charges, including conspiracy to commit wire fraud on customers, wire fraud on customers, conspiracy to commit wire fraud on lenders, and actual wire, fr wire fraud on lenders, Com conspiracy to commit commodities fraud, securities fraud, money laundering, all of these conspiracy, and then finally, which Anne-Marie was just discussing, conspiracy to do defraud the U.S. and violate campaign finance laws. And John, as you rightly point out, in these allegations, as well as the charges uh, placed by the SEC, they say this was a years-long effort. We're talking back to 2019, that this wasn't just some episode that all started and really began in November, that this was a concerted, knowing effort on the part of Sam Bankman-Fried uh, for years as he dealt with not just FTX, but Alameda. And this really goes against what Sam Bankman-Fried has been saying this whole time, which this was accidental and he did not knowingly commit fraud on anyone. The Southern District of New York, the SEC and the CFTC all today saying they beg, beg to differ. Kelly Lines, Shanali Vasek, AMH, three of the very best on this story. That hearing's coming up in about seven minutes' time. It's just not the hearing we expected about 24 hours ago. Coming up on this program, the market moving events you need to be watching. That'll be next in our trading diary. This equity market absolutely ripping from New York. This is Bloomberg.
25 minutes into the session, equities pushing higher off the back of a softer than expected inflation report in America yesterday on the S&P. Biggest one day pop at a close of the month so far. We're looking to beat that today. We're up by 2.76 percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq up by 3.84 percent. You can guess what's happening with bond yields. Twos, tens and thirties looking a little something like this off the back of that inflation surprise to the downside. Softer than expected. Yields lower at the front end by 22 basis points on a two year. We are down to 4.1598 on a 10 year. We're down about 18 basis points to 3.42.85. Just a snapshot of the price action. Let's get you the trading diary. The president will have things to say on the inflation report at the White House at the top of the hour. Look out for that. The FTX testimony on Capitol Hill goes on without Sam Bankman Fried. A Fed rate decision and Chairman Powell news front conference coming up tomorrow, followed by decisions from the BOE and the ECB on Thursday, plus another round of jobless claims. And in the mix, retail sales and PMIs to close out the week. From New York, that does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the countdown to the open. This. It's Bloomberg.